glad to be back with you folks. A beautiful sign out front. I almost missed the church. Changed to the Faith Baptist. Amen. <laughs> and uh, we thank the Lord for what God is doing in the church here. Thank you for the pastor's friendship to our family. Appreciate my mom being involved here. And, of course, the pastor and the church taking care of my family. We're glad to be with you this morning. Uh, there at Heartland, of course, we escaped the ice. Uh, there's ice going on there. And, of course, we're glad that we're here in a safe place. But Heartland Beth Bible College had a great semester. We had 440-some students this past semester. Thank God for the 17th year he's given us there, and of course we're looking forward to a new crop coming in in January. Uh, some have graduated midterm, and we have a few more coming in, I believe, and so we're looking forward to that. We have 16 in our graduate school, still offer all those ministry aspects of it. As far as one year of opportunity to get all the way to grad school, and we appreciate your prayers for our ministry there. Things are going well in spite of me. Things are going well. We thank the Lord for what God is doing there, and looking forward to God's blessing in the upcoming days. Thank you for your prayer support. We have a church planning conference coming up, and so Pastor, you can pray for that as a church. Church planning conference. We try to help church planners across America, motivating them and encouraging them. In the first, uh, when the first the school opens up in January, we have a three-day church planning conference. Looking forward to that. I think we have around 60 church planners already signed up. Some missions projects also signed up. I'm looking forward to a great time. It's like revival breaking out on campus. <laughs> and so uh, we want to make sure that um, we pray for that particular meeting. And if you can have a part. I think Pastor's been there at least once yes. up to that meeting. Oh, wow. And so uh, we're thankful for him coming and thankful for the church, what they do here. Keep up the good work, church. Thank you for having a place we can come and worship in here at Kokomo. We come to visit Mom. Thank you. Yeah, before you leave, Bob Pearson, how much money did they raise when they normally raise every year for home missions? Down there, down, down there, the well, it's different every year, but last year we raised almost three hundred thousand uh, dollars with support, monthly support, and a cash offering. I think of two hundred thirty some thousand dollars. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's just that's just for helping struggling churches right in the United States. It's just an inspiration to come down in January to their home missions conference and see the pastors come from all over the country for that for that meeting, and then the. The outpouring of love and support of new yes. churches. And you know, that should encourage us that new churches are being planted that are standing for what's right. Amen. You know, we're living in a world today where so many churches are going so they're compromising. But to know that there's good Bible colleges turning out solid young men that are not only going on the foreign mission field, but also going right here to our own country. Amen. America is one of the biggest mission fields in the world. One particular state where God has really been working is Washington State. A lot of new church plants up there where our son lives, out in that area. In fact, uh, my, my son's pastor is a Harvard graduate uh, there at uh, Harvest Baptist Church. And uh, but, uh, there's many new works getting started there. My friend Danny Fountain, his son went out to Moses Lake, and he's a graduate of Harvard. Yep. And he started work on a little town called Moses Lake, and he took the work that was about ready to close its doors. Today they're moving. And they're winning souls, and they're making a big difference in the state of Washington. So, And then you just translate that throughout the whole country. And think about this, Harlem is just one of many sure. independent fundamental Baptist Bible-believing colleges, amen? Mm -hmm. And think about the many young men and then their spouses and others are going out in those schools and making a difference, amen? And so that's what we're going to be doing until Jesus comes and no one's doing it like the independent Baptists are, amen? I mean, I don't know anybody that's still studying for the KJV like we are. Amen. I don't know anybody that's involved in world missions yep. like we are. We are we're God's Marine Corps in the latter days, amen? amen? We're the ones hitting the beaches with the gospel, so I praise God for that, and we appreciate Brother Pearson and his dear wife being with us today, and, and uh, just keep them up in prayer, and uh, as they work there, I know you do a lot of teaching in the school too, don't you, Brother? Yes, sir. As well, so he's very involved. He travels with the team in the summertime with the, with the singing team at promoting the school, so keep Brother Pearson up in your prayers. We appreciate you, brother. amen? Okay, well, we're going to have a couple more slides on this stand together as we turn to Isaiah, Chapter 22. I want to speak this morning on this subject today. Jesus Christ, the nail in a sure place. The nail in a sure place. The book of Isaiah, chapter 22, we'll begin reading in verse 20. We'll have prayer, and then we can be seated for the message from God's Word today. Chapter 22 of Isaiah, verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring, and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups, even the vessels of flagons. 
In that day, said the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the surplice be removed, and be cut down, and fall. And the burden that was upon should be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. I want to preach today on a very unusual prophecy in the Bible about our Savior, the nail in the sure place. Let's ask the Lord's blessing upon the preaching of His Word. Father, we come before You today in the name of Jesus. We thank You, Lord, that during this time of the year that we can focus upon Your birth. But Lord, we thank You, Lord, that the story did not end in a manger. It did not end in a stable. We thank You, Lord, that You're the coming King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. But Lord, until You come, I pray, Lord, that You might help us to be illuminated by Your Spirit, to speak to us through Your precious Word, and may Jesus be honored uplifted and glorified with this message today. May you change hearts and change lives. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Of all the names and titles in the Bible for the Lord Jesus, I think this is one of the most interesting, the nail. I don't know if you ever realized in Bible prophecy or in Bible typology that Jesus Christ is referred to as the nail in a sure place. Now you may say, well, preacher, uh, this is talking about Elkanah or Eliakim, who would be uh, of the house and lineage of Judah. That's certainly true. But the Bible's a two-edged sword, amen? Not only is this referring in an immediate sense to this Eliakim, but if you look at this, uh, the entire statement, you know that this goes far beyond just Eliakim. We know that this refers to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, the Bible says in this passage... That when God gives him a door, it says, He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. And of course, obviously, that same terminology in the book of Revelation is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a wonderful Bible statement that is made in Bible interpretation, and it's this. In, in the Old Testament, is the new concealed. But in the New Testament, is the old revealed. Amen? Amen? And what I'm saying is, as we follow this typology through the Bible, the nail, we're going to discover some very beautiful things in the Word of God. But I want to take you all the way back to Genesis, to the very first prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. Get your Bible, if you would, and turn to Genesis chapter 3, and look at me in verses 14 and verses 15. Now, I will say this is for this is a message, you don't want to lose track of me. Amen? Stay with me today, and I'll help you from God's Word, and I think it will make the Christmas time even more meaningful to you as we look at this wonderful analogy in the Bible of Jesus Christ spoken of as the nail in a sure place. In Genesis chapter 3, look at verses 14 and verse 15. Of course, we know that after the fall of man, that God pronounced a curse upon the serpent. And obviously, God had to bring judgment upon the woman, upon the man, because of sin. And this world has been a world cursed and judged by sin ever since the fall of man. You know, I think it's interesting. God, man, always wants to blame God for everything. But what we ought to do when we see calamity, we see problems, we see difficulties, difficulties in the world, we ought to blame the real source, and it's man's sin. Amen? Yeah, amen. And beyond that, the devil causes an awful lot of havoc in the, world, in the world as well, doesn't he? And so as you look at this passage, this is the very first messianic prophecy in the Bible. If you look here in your Bible, in chapter 3, and look at verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the servant, Because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle, upon every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now I think we need to understand, the serpent as originally created by God was not an ugly and hideous animal. Amen? In fact, the Bible tells us that he was the most beautiful of all of God's creatures. Now I think you ladies would admit to me today that you don't consider the snake today or the serpent as the most beautiful of all the creatures. And that's because it appears differently now than what it did before the fall of man. God put a curse upon the serpent. And then God continues this in verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now don't be so shallow-minded and think that this just speaks of the fact that women would not have an affinity towards snakes. Amen? There's much more in this prophecy than that. Sure. The Bible says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, speaking of the seed of the serpent, and between thy seed and her seed. But look what it says. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now what I think is very interesting, in the book of Judges is a story about a man by the name of Sisera who was an enemy of God. And he goes into a tent, and when he goes into the tent, Jael, a female, takes a nail and drives it through his temples and destroys Sisera. Amen? You know what a type that is? You know that God took a woman named Mary, and through Mary came the nail? 
and to the nail was the serpent's head destroyed. Amen. So Sarah was killed by a nail through the temples. Can you imagine that taking place? He's laying, he's hiding in her blanket. She bits him a hammer, she bits him a nail, and she drives it right through his head. That's a wonderful story. You want some, uh, you want some good horror stories? There's some good ones in the Bible. Amen. But see, he was an enemy of God, and, and she brought judgment. Do you realize in a very real sense through Mary bringing to birth the Son of God, the nail? That the serpent's head was destroyed. You want to kill a snake, don't step on his tail, amen? Take care of his head. You take care of the head, you'll take care of the serpent. What I'm saying is this is wonderful Bible typology in the Word of God, the nail. There's so much here in this subject. But you see, enmity would exist between the seed of the woman and the seed of the man. In crushing the head of the serpent, the heel of the Messiah would be bruised. And of course, we see this. If you want to read that story, we won't take time for it this morning. But you can read Judges chapter 4, verses 12, 14 to 21. You may jump that down and maybe in a future time and read that story of the nail. But who was this one referred to as the nail in numerous passages throughout the Old Testament? Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Ezra today. And let's go a little bit further in our, in our study. We're going to come back to the book of Isaiah as well. But let's go to the book of Ezra, if you would, today in God's Word. Let me show you some things as to the identity of the nail. That's the first question we're going to ask today. And who is this nail? The book of Ezra, which is a, during the return stage. Israel had been in captivity for 70 long years. And of course, Nehemiah had gone back to rebuild the temple. That was an exciting book in the Bible, the rebuilding of the walls. But Ezra was the scribe that God used during that period of time, and of course he was overseeing the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Now do you understand that the very first temple that was built was the one built by Solomon? And no temple that was ever built exceeded the glory of Solomon's temple. But of course you know the story, how the God allowed the northern kingdom to be led off into captivity because of their sin, because of their apostasy. And then about 160 years after Israel was taken off into captivity and scattered abroad, God allowed Babylon to come and besiege Jerusalem and surround Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, during that time, under, under Nebuchadnezzar, they came in and they destroyed the temple. They carried the people off into captivity. And the Bible says that they hung their harps upon the, upon the willows. They said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They were in captivity. Now, if you read sometime in your Bible, Psalm 126, that was the song they sang when they returned back into Jerusalem, and they came back, and they came back to rebuild the walls, and they came back to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. And so Ezra prophesied during that time. Just to give you a little bit of background, in the days of Ezra's prophecy, Israel had been in captivity for 150 years. The beautiful city of Jerusalem has been plundered. The temple has been destroyed by the Babylonian invasion. The fortified walls of the city have been destroyed, and the gates were moved and destroyed. The city was virtually in absolute ruins at the time when they came. The Medo-Persian government was now in power. And Cyrus, the king of Persia, granted Ezra permission to return to Jerusalem to survey the destruction and then to rebuild the Jewish temple. Now it was during this period when the temple was being rebuilt that Ezra delivered this prophecy concerning the nail. Let's look at it in the book of Ezra chapter 9 and look at verses 5 through 8. The book of Ezra chapter 9 and notice with me verses 5 through 8. The Bible says in verse 5, And at the evening sacrifice I arose from my, from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and I spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. Notice as was prayer. And I said, Oh my God, I am ashamed, and I blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass has grown up into under the heavens. I think I can say today without apology that we can easily pray that same prayer today over our own country. Amen. As I look at the ruins of our nation, and by the way, our country, we may have beautiful cities, and we may have fine furnishings. And we may live in fine homes and have wonderful luxuries, but I want to tell you something from a spiritual standpoint, America is in ruins, amen? When I look at the destruction of the family, the home, the destruction of lives, the number of individuals that find themselves addicted to drugs and alcohol and every other form of addiction, obviously our country is in ruins as well. I believe God has called all of us to be like Ezra, to be wall builders, amen, and to be people, to be those that would point people back to the place of, of security, which is the church of the living God, amen? Just as surely as they were rebuilding the temple, we have a responsibility to our local church, amen? The local church is God's temple in the year 2013, right. 
amen, going into 2014 very rapidly. And so Ezra begins this process with prayer. Now it's in prayer that God speaks to him, amen? And you know, that's where we need to discover God speaking to us in prayer. And so he begins to talk about their sin in verse 6. And then he says in verse 7, Since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, who delivered in the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to spoil, and to confuse the face as it is this day. I have people say all the time, how in the world can we as an American country that was once such a great Christian nation, how can we have arrived at where we're at today? In fact, many of you that grew up in a different time in America than what I've grown up, you would look at our country and wonder whether it was even the same place. Amen? What I'm saying is that there was confusion of faces in this day, and certainly we see it on every hand today when it comes to the places of, of leadership within our nation. There's a great drought of spiritual leadership. And so he begins to confess the sins of the nation. And then he says in verse 8, he says, And now for a little space, grace has been shown to the Lord our God. Do you understand that right now, in spite of as bad as things are, we still have a little grace, amen? Mm -hmm. We still have an opportunity, is what it's saying. What Ezra's saying is, God, you've given us some grace. You've let us come back into the land. We've returned to the captivity. And now that we have suffered desperately because of our sin, we have a little space, Amen. I believe that America still has a little space to repent. Don't you believe that today? I believe there's still an opportunity for souls to be saved. There's still an opportunity to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in the midst of all things that are going on, he says there's a little grace that's been shown to us from our God. Now look what it says. To leave us a remnant to escape. You know something? If you're a Bible-believing, fundamental Christian, you're in the minority today. As many churches as we have, in fact, I know that Hartland tracked about 12,000 churches that are like our church, that are King James Version, Bible believing, holding to the old faith. Amen. Praise God for that. But if you compare that to all of Christendom, we're still just a small remnant. Amen. If you compare that to all the churches, and I'm not saying there's bad in every church, but I'm thankful to God for, for churches that are standing for what's right, sure. as everyone else is compromising today, and everyone else is giving up and throwing in the towel. And, and, and allowing themselves to be conformed to the world. I'm thankful to be a part of a group of churches that, that are saying, listen, we're going to stand. And we're not going to compromise in these areas. And we have established some things. There are some things that are surely believed among us that are not negotiable. Amen? Amen. Thank God for that today. But it's still a remnant compared to the rest of the world and all the Christians. Amen? Mm -hmm. As you look here at the Word of God, the Bible says here, to leave us a remnant to escape, to give us, now look what it says, to give us a nail. Now here's the key about the nail. Where at? In the holy place. Amen? Amen. You know there's only one person that could actually go into the holy of holies, and that was the high priest. The high priest could only enter in, and actually if you study the Old Testament, the high priest went in one time per year on the day of atonement, and when he went and offered the sacrifice, because he himself was born a sinner, he had to offer a sacrifice both for himself as well as for the people. Amen? But he went in once on the, on the Day of Atonement. By the way, you know, they also wore bells around their garment lest they went in there with a sinful heart. And God took their life and struck them dead. They actually had a rope tied around their ankle in case they died in the Holy of Holies. That they could be drawn out of there without anyone else going in there. Because if someone else dared enter, they would be struck dead by God. This holy place is very important in this, in this passage where our nail exists. You realize that Jesus is our great high priest that has entered into the holiest, amen, into a sure place for us. Thank God we have a nail, but that nail exists in the holy place. We're going to see this in the Word of God. The Bible says here, a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little revival in our bodies. You say, preacher, what are you praying for? I'm praying that God would give us revival even in the midst of our bondage. Are we as free as we should be? No, we are not. We're not nearly as free as what our founders intended for us to be as Americans. Amen. I think we understand that today. But I'll tell you something. We are far freer than many other people around the world, as I've already touched on, as we're praying for the martyrs and those that are suffering for their faith around the world. We still have a great deal of freedom. But I think we also need to understand we're not nearly as free as what our founders intended for us to be. And you say, Pastor, why? Because we as a nation no longer want to be ruled by God. You know, the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Why was there liberty in this country? Because the Spirit of God was operating. Had it not been for those great revivals that took place in this country, we would have never had the great nation that God gave us. But the reality is, yes, we do find ourselves in bondage on our own land today. Israel 
went back by permission back in there. But they were under Medo-Persian rule at that time. You look around and you say, well, how did we ever get under this form of government? God's allowed it as a judgment. Amen. <laughs> it's a judgment upon us. We need to recognize that this morning. But the Bible says that God gave him a nail in the sure place, in his holy place, that God may enlighten our eyes and give us a little reviving. Notice this. We look here at the nail in the holy, in the holy place. A remnant to escape. A nail, a spiritual light, and a little reviving in the midst of bondage. This is what God promised. Now, second of all today, what will this nail accomplish? You, will, you say, well, preacher, what's the importance of a nail? Let's go back to the book of Isaiah 22. Let's look at it again very carefully today. In this passage, it is plain to see that Eliakim is a wonderful type and a foreshadow of Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah. We see it here in this passage. Let's go back and look at it carefully today. Now, I want to share with you, I'm giving you some meat today. You know, a preacher, we need to give people milk, but we can't just live on milk. We need some meat as well, amen? And so you can expect as a pastor, I'm going to give you milk, but I'm also going to feed you some meat, okay? As we look at the meat of God's Word here, as we look at the name Eliakim, he is a foreshadow, he is a type, he is a picture of Jesus Christ whom we worship today. His name means this. It means God will establish. Now, what's the purpose of a nail? A nail fastens. Mm. A nail establishes things. Amen? I used to work for a long time as a carpenter. And I enjoy carpentry. I still enjoy to this day. Now, I know we live in a day today where a lot of carpenters use pneumatic tools. I'm not into that. Amen? Give me a hammer and give me a nail, eh, friend? And let me drive those nails. Amen? I like to do it the way it ought to be done. Amen? I just like it that way. Uh, but you know, you think about a nail, what's the purpose of a nail? It fastens things together, it brings security, it brings stability to a building. You can't build very well without nails. It's a very important part of this work. What will this nail accomplish? Well, it means God will establish. Now, I want you to notice some things about, about Elijah in the new scribe. Look at verse 22, it says, I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. You ever thought about our Savior that God dressed him in all the glory of his Father? Full of grace and truth. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ. This is a picture of Jesus Christ. He is clothed with the robe of his father and strengthened with his father's girdle, even so with Christ. The Bible says in John 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, to understand the identity of the Word, the Bible says all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. That was made. Right. But that same word that is described as God in John 1.1, 1, 1, if you go down to verse 14, the Bible says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You, you may be here today, maybe you're not that familiar with Christianity, but I want to say this to you today. This time of Christmas is all about focusing on the incarnation. What does that word incarnation mean? It means that God became man. Man literally, God literally wrote, wrote himself in humanity for the purpose of living that sinless life, dying on the cross as our substitute, rising triumphant over the grave. Jesus Christ truly is that one that all the glory of his Father hung upon him. If you ever put a nail on a wall and you use it to hang something on, amen? God took his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the nail. He made him as a nail in a sure place in the very holy voice, but he hung upon that nail. All the glory of his Father. Let's look at it just for a moment in the book of Philippians. Get your Bible and look your place in Isaiah 22 because we're going to come back there. Amen? Turn some pages today. Go way back to Philippians chapter 2. I think Philippians 2 is one of the greatest descriptions of all that God did. And we preached on it a couple of weeks ago from a little different angle, okay, about the mind of Christ. But we're going to go back to it and look at it from a little bit different standpoint today. And we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2 and look at what the Bible says about the Lord Jesus because we see here the humility of Christ in His humanity. And taking on humanity, there was a great deal of humility. If you look at chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now think about this. Jesus did not begin in a stable in Bethlehem. That was not the beginning of Jesus Christ. The book of Hosea says His goings forth have ever been of old. Amen? What I'm saying is that Jesus is the pre-existent, always existent, ever existent, eternal Son of God. Amen. You think about this, that Jesus, or God, God is called the everlasting Father. Well, you cannot have an everlasting Father without also having an eternal Son as well. You ever think about that? You know, I'm a father today. I'm also a grandfather. But I'm not an everlasting father. You know what? There was a time when I wasn't married. There was a time we had no children. Amen? And so my fatherhood had a beginning. Our God's fatherhood never began. You know why? Because it's eternal, because He always had a son. 
Because Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. And we need to understand that truth today. Okay, so if you look here at chapter 2, it says in this passage, verse 6, who being in the form of God, it thought not robbery to be equal with God. But look what it says. Here's what Christmas is all about. But he made himself of no reputation. How did he do that? He made his way into the womb of Mary through the virgin birth. Amen? Through that miraculous conception. The Holy Spirit impregnated the egg of Mary. And God himself, God the Son, literally made that journey from heaven into the womb of Mary. You think about that. What a wondrous thing that is. What an act of humility for the everlasting creator God to wrap himself up in the body of a fetus. And that poor baby. Amen? And for Mary to carry by Jesus in her womb for those nine-month period. And then after that 45-mile journey on a donkey, I think most of you mothers would go into labor after 45 miles on a donkey, amen? And you think about that, that journey, and then his lowly birth and being born there in a stable and being laid as a babe in a manger, amen? I've often thought what's interesting about the Christmas story is what better place for a lamb to be born than in a stable, Amen? Who would be more interested in the birth of, of a lamb than shepherds? The shepherds were the first to hear, and they were the first to arrive. Who would be more excited about the birth of a lamb than shepherds? Amen? I think about the Christmas story. I get excited around this time of year. Just think about it, meditating over all that took place there at the birth of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice the Bible says he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of man. Verse 8, and being found in fast as a man, he humbled himself. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. You know, the Bible says in Acts, it says there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is the name of salvation. It literally means Jehovah is salvation, but Isaiah also prophesied his name should be called Emmanuel. Which being interpreted is what? God is with us. Amen. May I say today as we come here to worship Him together in this service today. He's with us today. The name is with us today, Christian. Amen. He's the nail in the sure place. And so we find here as we look at the Word of God, what a beautiful type. What will the nail accomplish? Well, let's look here at God's Word. He will possess the key of David. Now think about the different names for Jesus. He's called the Son of Man. He's called the Son of God. But he's also called the son of David. Amen? You know why he has the key of David. Now what's the purpose of a key? A key unlocks a door. Amen? If I come up to the door and that door is locked, I'm not getting through if I don't have the key. And I want to say this to you today. If you come to church today, though you've walked through the door of the church, you cannot walk through the door of salvation unless you have the key. And that key is the key of David. And Jesus Christ is the door, but he's also the key that unlocks the door. He has the key of David. In fact, we find as we look at the Word of God, if you study the lineage of, of Jesus, and you can study that on your own in the book of Matthew as well as the book of Luke, as you study those two lineages or those genealogies of Jesus Christ, it's interesting. One goes from the past forward, and one goes from the present back. But both of them, you'll discover this, that both of them had a direct lineage through the house of David. And you can study that, and you'll find that both Joseph, who was the stepfather of the Lord Jesus, as well as Mary, who was the actual mother of our Lord, directly found them their lineage back to David. You know, there was times when that lineage became very thin. There were times when the enemy almost destroyed the line of Christ. I think about Josiah. Josiah's dead. You realize he was the only one left? And had Athaliah the king been successful in taking the life of Josiah as her goal was? Do you realize the line of Christ would have been broken and Bible prophecy could not have been fulfilled? But thank God for those courageous priests in the temple that literally put an armed guard around Josiah and protected him. Amen. Praise God for that. You know, I, I look at the Bible and I realize, look at the providential things that God did that brought about the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. You know, the Bible's an exciting book. Turn off the TV. Turn on the Bible. Amen. <laughs> There's an awful lot to get out of, the, out of the Bible, out of the Word of God. But we find as we look at this passage then that, that God clothed upon him. God put upon him all the glory of his Father, full of grace and truth. That's our Savior. I want you to notice the government will be placed in His hands. Look what the Bible says here in chapter 22. Let's go back to Isaiah. The Bible says, I will commit thy government into His hand. Flip back to you with just a few pages in your Bible in Isaiah, back to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Let's just go back and look at some prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. 
Look at verse 6. This is a passage I think we need to be reminded of at Christmas time. Verse 6, the Bible says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. You know, I want to start of notice today on every human government. They may not realize this, but God is sovereign over every form of human government on this earth, and Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, they may not recognize Him, they may not submit themselves to Him, but that doesn't alter His sovereignty, and that does not alter the fact that He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And one day the nations of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, I've read the last chapter of the book. Amen? And I know what's coming, haven't you? And so one day Jesus Christ will come in great power and great glory. And He will assume the full reign that was given to Him by His Father. The Bible says the government shall be upon His shoulder. I love this. Look at His names. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Praise God. Amen. I think I get excited when I get to read the Bible. And I get to sing the future that we have to look forward to. Thank God that we have a Savior. Thank God that we have a nail in the sure place. Now we also see in the Word of God that the Bible says concerning this, this Christ that when He opens a door, no man can shut it. When He shuts a door, no one can open it. You say, well, you sure that's not just talking about Eliakim? Well, if you look at your Bible and compare some Scripture with Scripture, you will find out that this is referring to none other than the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Get your Bible, if you will, and turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Way, way back in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 3, and verse 7 in God's Word. And let's just see what the Bible has to say about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad that He has the power the authority to open doors, aren't you? I think about countries of the world. We have missionaries serving in countries where you cannot serve as a missionary legally. Okay? He said, well, how are they in there? Because the Lord opened the door. Amen? I know missionaries that are in Mongolia today. Mongolia is not an open country, but the Lord has missionaries that are doing the work of God bringing the Bible into Mongolia. What about Morocco? Can you go to Morocco as a missionary? No, not. You can't go and declare yourself as a missionary, but we have missionaries there. Amen? Why? Because when the Lord opens the door, no man can shut it. When He shuts the door, no man can open it. Look at the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and I'll try to stay close to my notes here. Chapter 3, and verse 7. The Bible says in this passage, To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith, He that is holy, He that is true, He that hath the key of David, He that openeth, and no man shutteth. And shut them, no man open. That's why as a Christian, you should not be overwhelmed and be upset over closed doors. You know why? If the Lord wants you to go through a door, you'll go through it. Mm -hmm. If He doesn't, you don't want to go through it. Amen? The thing is, He's the one that is the, has the key in His hand to open and shut doors for you and I. And so when He opens the door, pass through it. But if He shuts it, you'd be a fool to try to get through the door He's locked. Amen? What I'm trying to say today is that He is sovereign in this world. He is still ruling. This world may not revere Him. They may not reverence Him. They may not submit themselves to Him willingly. But I want to serve notice on the world today that He's still Lord. That doesn't alter His Lordship. It does not alter His sovereignty. It does not alter His kingship. He is still King. He is still sovereign. He is still Lord. Whether anyone submits to Him. Amen. Now as a Christian, I'm thankful to God to be His subject. Amen. And I willingly, lovingly submit myself to Him. I hope that you do as well. But you know something? Just because the world does not recognize His sovereignty does not mean that He's not sovereign. And the Bible says this about Him in Isaiah 22. It says, I will lay upon His shoulder and He shall open, none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. Verse 23, and I will fasten Him as a nail in a sure place. You know something? Our Savior, no one can change His kingship. No one can change His Lordship. And no one can change the fact that He is now our great high priest and He's ever living to make His session for us. He's at work today. Amen? He's at work in hearts. He's at work in lives today. Praise God for that today. And so He is my nail. He is my nail in a sure place. He will be fastened as a nail in a sure place. His Melchizedek priesthood is not temporary. It's eternal. Amen? Praise God for that. So much scripture. If I gave you every scripture I, that I have written down today, we'd be here all day. Amen? But what I'm saying today is this. If you study the priesthood of Jesus, it's not temporary. It's permanent. It's eternal. Amen? Praise the Lord. He is passing the heavens where He ever lives to make intercession for us. 
He will also come in this world as a king. Look here at the word of God. The Bible says in this passage in verse 23, And I will pass him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne in it to his father's house. A glorious throne. He has a kingly throne. Do you understand when those kings came and they bowed down and they worshipped him? They were worshipping not just the birth of a savior, but they were coming because a king was to be born. And they came to worship the king of kings. <coughs> and they came to worship the Lord of Lords. And they brought those three gifts of gold, speaking of his kingly reign, of frankincense, speaking of his high priestly work, and then of myrrh, speaking of his death. Those gifts were prophetic in their significance when they came. I don't know whether there were three kings, but there were three, three, three gifts. Amen? And those gifts that were significant of his ministry, um, and both his present and his future ministry to you and I. He came into this world as king and glorious for unto his father's house. He came because of God's displeasure with the religious leaders of that day. Get your Bible if you want to turn to Zechariah chapter 10. Book of Zechariah chapter 10. We're just taking some time today to search the scriptures together. It'll do us good. Amen? Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think that you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. If you look in your Bible in Zechariah 10, look at verses 1 through 4 in God's Word today. Zechariah 10. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the light of rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. For the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie, and have told false dreams, they comfort in vain, and therefore they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. You see, Israel's problem was they had no shepherd that would truly fall. Now, David was their greatest shepherd king. And David is the greatest type of the Lord Jesus as far as kings are concerned in the Old Testament. He was the one who was the man for God's own heart. But look at verse 3. <clears throat> the Bible says, By an anger was kindled against the shepherds. By the way, they were the leaders of Israel. But sadly, they were the blind leaders of the blind. You see, it was not the common people. Now think about this today, folks. It was not the common people that were responsible for the death of Jesus. Yes, it was our sins that put him there. But if it had been up to the common people, they would have crowned him as a king. They would have put a diadem upon his head. You know who rejected him was the leaders of Israel. They were the ones who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They were the ones who saw him as a threat to their peace and their security. Now look what the Bible says prophetically. God speaking, my anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts had visited his flock and the house of Judah, and made them his goodly horse in the valley. But look what it says. It says, out of him came forth what? The corner? The Bible calls Jesus the chief cornerstone. Amen? The stone that the builders rejected, the same became the head of the corner. But not just the corner, out of him the nail. Isn't that interesting? The nail. Who is the nail? The nail is Jesus. Amen? Out of him the nail. The nail, where does he exist? He's in the sure place. Out of him the battle bow. Out of him every oppressor together. You see, this prophecy of the nail is not isolated. It's found throughout the Bible. It's found in Isaiah. It's found in Ezra. Here it's found in Zechariah. And so what will this nail accomplish? This nail in the sure place accomplishes a, a permanent, eternal priesthood to you and I. Today, I can go before the Father... And I have a nail in the sure place. Who is that? That's Jesus, my great intercessor. Amen? He is the one that is the, the source of my spiritual security today. It's all about Jesus today. It's all about Him. He is my nail in the sure place. I think about the many prophecies concerning the nail. He will bear all the glory of His Father's house. Just like one used a nail to hang one's garments, God the Father placed all of His glory, hung all of His glory upon the Son of God, the Lord Jesus. The nail will be temporarily removed, cut down and fall. What does that speak of? Though he was there in Israel, he came into his own, and his own rejected him. And they did not accept him, they did not receive him. And for a period of time, the nail was cut down. He was removed, he was cut down. This is an unmistakable reference to Israel's rejection and their crucifixion of their own Messiah. And you can take time to read Daniel's 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, verses 24 to 26. And you'll see there that the Bible says the Messiah would be cut off. And he was for a period of time. Amen? The Messiah was cut off. That burden that was upon it should be cut off. This is the reference to Christ who became the sin bearer. He became sin for us who knew no sin. 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Amen. For a period of time, yes, He hung up on the cross, had to be forsaken by His Father. And during that time, the just died, but the unjust did not bring us to God. But thank God that it did not end there on the cross. It did not end in a place of curse. It ended in a place of victory with an empty tomb. Praise God for that today. Where did we find the nail? You know, if you and I were searching for a nail, the most likely place to find one would be where? In the home of a carpenter. Amen? Carpenters know all about nails. Amen? We always used to make a joke. How many, how many nails does a good carpenter bring home every night? We always said, we always said 20. Okay? What do you mean 20? Well, you ought to have, you ought to have uh, 10 on your hands and 10, and 10 on your toes. Amen? <laughs> you don't want to lose those nails. Amen? No, what I'm saying today is this. Where would you find a nail? You'd find it in the home of the carpenter. Just like you would find a lamb born in a stable, because Jesus was a nail and a lamb, you'd find a lamb born in a stable. What better place for a lamb to be born? We think, well, that's terrible. The lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was born in a stable. No, it was not terrible. It was God's plan. That was God's sovereign plan. Fulfilling biblical typology, the fact that Jesus Christ is a lamb. What, what, where else would you expect a lamb to be born but in a stable? Amen. Amen. But where else would you find a nail, a nail but in the house of the carpenter? Amen. Where else would you find a nail in the house of the carpenter? Joseph was a carpenter by trade. And that's exactly where we find the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse 16. Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. We look here at the Lamb. And we look at the nail today. Jesus Christ the nail. Some of you came to church and not even know that Jesus is, is pictured as a nail. Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 16. The Bible says in verse 16, it says very clearly here, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, as whom was born of Jesus, who is the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. Now look at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his, Mary, and when, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. We see here the home that God brought the Lord Jesus Christ into was the home of of the carpenter. You may say, well, preacher, what did the nail accomplish? Now, you remember the story I told you about J.L. that took the hammer and she drove the nail to the, to the temple of Sisera. Sisera, a type of Satan. J.L., a type of Mary, but the nail, a type of Jesus Christ. Amen? You remember that ancient prophecy? It shall bruise thy heel. By the way, nails were driven to the feet of Jesus and through his hands. Those nails that were driven through his feet as he was there upon the cross bruised his heel did not destroy him, but in bruising, in, in, in crushing the serpent's head, the heel of the Messiah had to be had to be bruised by a nail. Amen? It was bruised by a nail. You know, it's been said the only man-made things in heaven are the, are the nails, are the wounds, and the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, though he was the nail, had nails driven through his hands and through his feet, and he suffered and died on Calvary for you and I. What did he accomplish? Well, number one, he destroyed the power of Satan. Listen to what Jesus said in John 12. He says, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now listen to what he said. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. You know, the reality is the devil's power was destroyed when Jesus Christ fulfilled the mission God gave him. And you know, I'm sure the devil thought when they nailed Jesus Christ helplessly to the cross, I'm sure the devil thought that he had the victory. But the reality is that when Jesus expired, that's when the victory was won. Mm. Because he said the words, it is finished. And he said, Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. And they laid him in a borrowed tomb. But after three days and three nights, that one that Satan thought he had destroyed, conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he's alive today. Amen? Amen? Oh, that's the message of Christmas for us today is the fact that our Savior is alive. He destroyed the power of Satan. You realize that not only that, he spoiled principalities and powers. In Colossians 2.15, it says that having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Through his death. In fact, get your Bible and turn to Hebrews 2. Hebrews chapter 2. You realize that his death destroyed death? You ever thought about that? His death destroyed death. You say, well, how can death destroy death? Well, let me show you from God's Word. Hebrews chapter 2. Just look at it here today in the Word of God. Hebrews 2 is a wonderful passage, by the way. It's a great Christmas passage to read. Because it deals with Jesus and why he came. And I won't read the whole chapter today, obviously. 
But a couple of verses. Look at verse 14 and 15 of chapter 2. The Bible says, For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, and this is the Christmas story, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Why did, why did there have to be a virgin birth? Why did there have to be a, a, a miraculous conception? It was so that God could become man. Amen? He took part of the same. Now why? That through death, he might destroy him, Satan, that have the power of death, that is the devil. Look at verse 15. And deliver them, that's you and me, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He came as a direct descendant of our father Abraham. Amen? And as a result of that, we now can become children of God and we become sons of Abraham, sons and daughters of Abraham in Christ. Let's read on. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, and to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. What I'm telling you is that by becoming man, Jesus Christ enters into our sorrows and enters into our humanity and understands every human circumstance and emotion or problem or difficulty that we go through. He fully understands because he became man. You know, there's things that we do in ministry that we may not understand what someone else has gone through. I've ministered to many people with cancer, but I've never had cancer. Don't want it. Amen. Not, I'm not volunteering this morning. Amen. But if you've gone through it, you can understand someone else going through it. I've been here for over 20 years to people locked up in jail. Probably longer than that because I started preaching in jail when I was 19, okay? But, but up to this point, I've not been arrested and booked through a jail. Hey man, I'm not condemning someone who has, okay? I'm not trying to say that. And though I empathize with those individuals, I've not actually had to go through what they've gone through, amen? What I'm trying to say today is this. Our Savior was willing to go through what we go through, Amen? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest to us. What a blessing. Amen. That's why he becomes our nail in a sure place. Think about this as well. He crushed the head of the serpent. Amen. As I said earlier, if you want to kill a snake, don't step on his tail, crush his head. Amen. The Lord, by coming and being the nail, he crushed the serpent's head. Listen to what, what, what Paul said. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet, surely the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. I also love 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. It says, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy what? The works of the devil. By the way, the devil's still at work in this world today. But the fact is that Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. And sometimes we don't have the victory because we don't claim it. Mm -hmm. Amen? We miss out on the victory. We let the devil get the victory because we don't claim the victory that we already have in Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ already won the victory 2,000 years ago through His death, His burial, and His resurrection. God is waiting for a people who will claim the victory in Jesus Christ. He is the nail in this sure place. He bruised the head. He destroyed Satan's power. And then He took possession of the keys of hell and of death. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse 17 and verse 18. I told you I'd bring you the most unusual Christmas message you've ever heard. Amen? And I hope, I, I hope it's lived up to that, not for my glory, but for His glory. Yeah. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. As John sees the resurrected Savior, and by the way, we'll see Him one day face to face. And when I saw Him, I fell at His feet as dead. And He laid His right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am He that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. You want to get to heaven, you better make sure you get a hold of the one that has the keys. Amen? Amen. And the Lord Jesus Christ has the keys. Amen. And you know something? One day, that same Savior that provided salvation for the saved will also commit those to damnation that are lost. The Bible says he'll put, He will judge the quick and dead one day in His appearing in His kingdom. What I'm telling you today is this. We ought to take the instruction of Psalm 2. The Bible says, Kiss the Son, lest you be hangry, and you perish away when his anger is kindled by the little. Amen. I'm telling you today, the world doesn't mind a baby laying in a manger, but they don't like the thought of a, of a sovereign reigning. Amen. A Savior coming back. And you say, well, preacher, I think the world is ready for the coming of Jesus. I don't think so. Amen. 
As I read the word of God, the Bible says that one day when he comes, that the great men, the kings of the earth, will hide themselves in the rocks and in the dens of the world, and they'll call for them to fall upon them to hide themselves in the wrath of the Lamb. One day when he comes. Amen? No, this world is not going to welcome Jesus with open arms. And though at Christmas time they may sing joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare a room. And let heaven and earth, and they sing it. And you know something? We sing it and mean it. The world sings it, but they don't even know what they're singing. Because you know, you say, well, Pastor, how do you know they don't accept his reign? Well, look at how they treat those who stand for what his word says. Amen? We've seen it. We've seen an example of that this past week of a prominent television star, if you will. I don't look at them as a star, but they were. But they took a stand against something that God hates. And now they're out of there. Amen. And that tells you how much they're ready to receive the reign of Jesus. Amen. This world today. You know, we that are saved, we're here to worship Him. We're here to adore Him. And we're really just practicing for eternity. Amen. We've come here today on this Christmas Sunday. I love this Sunday. It's one of the greatest Sundays of the year. To come together to worship the Lord. Not, not just this Sunday, but the whole month. Putting the emphasis on Jesus. And we should do that all year long. What I'm saying is, we're just getting practical. We're just getting warmed up, Christian. Amen? Amen. Because we're looking forward to that day when forever we will worship Him forever and ever. And one day, as I said in my prayer this morning, one day the Lord's prayer will be answered. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. As is it. You know when that prayer will be answered? When He comes back again. <laughs> Amen? And He is coming. And you say, well, I've heard that my whole life. Yeah, but He is coming. And He'll come right on time. He's not one minute late. Amen? He's not going to come one minute early. He's going to come just like He came the first time. The Bible says in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, made of the woman, born of the law. He came in perfect fulfillment of God's timetable. He even died at the perfect time when God expected Him to die as the perfect Passover lamb. And I want to share with you, just like He came the first time, and just like He died the first time, when He comes back the second time, it will be right on time. Amen. Jesus said, if I go away, He said, I will come again. He is coming one day. And the Bible says, for those who look for Him, will He attend the second time without sin and the salvation. Amen. What about you today? Do you know the nail is the, is He your nail in the sure place today? Every head bowed, every eye closed today. The question.